Good afternoon. Um, my name is Johan Lund, and I'm co-executive director and CEO here at Raymond Modern, together with Aileen Burns. Thank you for gathering with us here today on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of MAT. We pay our respects to First Nation and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Today, we welcome Ken Lam for a conversation with Michelle Jakes, Head of Exhibitions and Collections and Chief Curator here at Raymond Modern, and myself. Ken is an artist, writer, editor, curator, and longtime professor. Currently, he's the Chair of Fine Arts at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Design in Philadelphia. And Ken, uh, Ken is one of Canada's most internationally recognized artists, and I would argue one of Canada's best art writers. It's been my immense pleasure to work with Ken and Michelle as co-curator on the show Death and Furniture, which is on view at Raimi Modern until May 15th. Ken was actually the first artist Aileen and I reached out to after arriving in Saskatoon. And we're pleased that our conversations have resulted in Ken's largest exhibition in Canada since his retrospective at the Vancouver Art Gallery in 2011. After its initial showing here at Raimi Modern, Death and Furniture will travel to the Art Gallery of Ontario, where it opens June 25th. Without further ado, I just uh, want everybody to give a warm welcome to Ken Lam. I'm, uh, I'm a little surprised at how discombobulated I feel. I, and I just realized this is the first time I've spoken in front of an audience um, at this kind of public program since February of 2020. Um, so it's a bit strange not having you mediated by the Zoom screen, seeing you in three dimensions. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to be participating in my, my first program at Ramey Modern as chief curator here. Um, and doubly thrilled that that public program is with Ken Lum. Um, when uh, Yuan and Aileen told me that they had reached out to Ken, I immediately muscled my way into the, the curatorial team and um, had a great time working on this exhibition with Yuan and with Ken. And I wanted to start off um, the conversation by um, sort of talking about how the exhibition came together. It came together very sort of fluidly. We would have Zoom meetings with Ken. He'd talk about different series of work that could be in the exhibition. Yuan, who um, is very interested and committed to the work, would say, oh, we've got to have the mirror maze. We've got to have this work. And um, I would fill some things in around uh, uh, Yuan's enthusiastically chosen work. And at a certain point, you know, we knew that we had enough work to fill the Marquee Gallery. And we hadn't really thought about what we were working towards. So we did a sort of assessment of the list of works that we had selected. And we thought, what is, what is this um, selection of work telling us? What can we call this exhibition? And the phrase that popped into my mind was death and furniture. Um, there's a series in the exhibition called Necrology, which are Ken's um, imagined um, uh, in memoriam texts to fictional people. And there are two of um, uh, the works from Ken's long running furniture sculpture series. And when I went to my favorite research, tool, Google, to figure out what death and furniture could mean if it meant anything. I learned that it's actually a phrase that is used in philosophical circles and that um, realists who are arguing with relativists who believe that, um, uh, that there is no shared um, reality, that we all come to the world with our own understanding of, of reality, uh, the realists would say, but there is a shared reality, and like bang their hand on a table and say, you know, furniture proves that we have a shared reality. Death proves that we have a shared reality. And um, I have to say that it was one of the most nerve wracking Zoom meetings I had over the past two years, presenting th that idea for the title to you. 
Um, it sounds a little cheeky, maybe. And I wondered if we could start out with you talking about what you thought when you first heard our proposal for the title. Um, were you humoring us when you enthusiastically said yes right away, or no? I thought it was it a, I thought it was a stroke of genius <laughs> on your part, right? Um, you're right. I mean, uh, you know, Plato wrote about uh, relativist philosophy, so it goes all the way back to the foundations of, of at least Western philosophy. But I also, it's actually uh, salient components of my work: the theme of death and the, and and the you know the deployment of furniture. Right, and um, yeah, and you're right. I mean, I could get into the philosophy of it, you know, because, uh, well, death and, f death and furniture are, are they're, they're not like, they're not tethered terms, but they are emblematic terms. They are emblematic for a whole host of other things having to do with the physical, the material, the haptic that exists in real time and space, right? And, um, and that this is the r incontrovertible reality. And then you have uh, furniture, which is, Less physical, but it's not furniture. I mean, death. It has to do with you know, eschatology, mortality, uh, and so on. And uh, and that's uh, a, 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 about uh, the, I guess, the reality that we have to take into consideration. So it's not necessarily the physical reality, but the reality that we are obliged to um, honor and acknowledge, such as, you know death by genocide, death, death by mass murder, death by all kinds of things. And so I, I'm always interested in those, <laughs> those, those lofty uh, terms, which you can see in my uh, writings as well. Right? So, um, and I'm always interested in um, the way, I guess the f f philosophically, you know, what is, what is the reality that confronts us? And, and, but I know I'm not interested in it from a, necessarily from a f philosophical point of view. Right? I'm more interested in terms of you know what is what are the various narratives that comprise comprise our lives and so on and and as, as you know we live in a private uh, we live in a social economy of privacy I mean privacy as, as far as capitalization of space and so on and so given that right furniture is like an implement of a kind of facilitator in terms of the private spaces that we we construct around right? how we organize configure ourselves through furniture. Right? And, um, and of course, death is kind of the ultimate uh, marker of, um, you know, of, well, according to Derrida, it's, the, it's, the, it's, not, a, it's not the opposite of um, life. It's, it's what um, limits l life in order to validate life, which is a slightly nuanced, but it's important. So I thought the title was great. <laughs> I thought it was right up. When you, when you said it, it just kind of, resonated in me. I went, oh yeah, that's a great title. Great. I'm glad. <laughs> well, Michelle, another <clears throat> moment as well. We're having to try and sell it to the AGO, which is also a bit of a moment of trying to stir maybe slightly less um, open to, to titles like that. But they also have it. But I want to actually talk to you. I've, I've, uh, Ken has an incredible book that came out a couple of years ago that's really looking at your writing from the 90s to the to uh, the 2000s, uh, Everything is Relevant, which is a great title for a book. And it's interesting, that book, that covers so many of the things that you're interested in, everything from Canadian cultural policy to your own work. But actually, your furniture sculpture work is kind of somewhat absent from that thing. And I know you've been working on the furniture sculpture since the 80s and did a lot in the uh, 70s and in, uh, many of the works in the 80s. Uh, if you just humor me for one moment, do you, do you want to talk a bit more about the furniture sculpture? Because it is, is it one of the longest kind of threads in your practice, but it mm -hmm. is, seems somewhat misunderstood by critics and somewhat under theorized even by yourself. Like you clearly have a lot of thoughts and ideas around it, but, but how did it kind of start and why did you continue on it and why is it kind of still such a big part of your practice? Anyway? Well, well, first of all, the, um, yeah, I don't really, uh, it, that, my book of writing yeah. is, I, yeah. is a bit unusual for an artist because I'm not actually writing about my own work, right? There's very few, I don't think there's a single essay in there where I talk about my own work, really, yeah. right? It's really uh, my kind of thinking about, you know, art's operations in, in the world and what, what, what should be its proper functioning in relationship to uh, philosophy, politics, social economy, 
and, and those types of, uh, and, and otherness, I guess, and yeah. so those types of questions. But um, the, the furniture work came out of, um, well, I guess I, it, when, when I was first, it goes all the way back to, to when I first took my first art class. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I was a science student, and when I took my first art class, I, I was already uh, an illustrator for the British Columbia government, right? I was doing all kinds of ink drawings of flora and fauna uh, part-time for the Ministry of the Environment and the Ministry of um, Agriculture, and then later on I was the illustrator for the Vancouver Public Libraries. So I do, you know, ink drawing posters of, um, of you know, puppet show at 1, 1, 1 p.m. and things like that, right? And um, so my conception of what art could be was, was basically limited to, uh, you know, graphic design and uh, applied art, you might say. Um, and, uh, and so when I was introduced to art for the first time, I was introduced quite early on to uh, American avant-garde art of the 60s, um, like minimal art. And I remember uh, thinking this is all you know, like, um, charlatan work or something, right? Because how, how, could this be, how could this be art, right? And of course I was wrong because I soon realized that um, it had its own logic and, had, and, and so on. But it really offended me on a very deep level. Mm. But um, it offended me because it went so contrary to my, the way I was brought up to think about what art was and what art is, you know, because I can draw a horse, for example, and, and I thought, well, that makes me qualified to be an, <laughs> be an artist, right? But um, I, I soon um, realized that uh, that's the wrong way of thinking, that art, you know, especially in this age of mechanical reproduction, you, you don't actually need to be able to draw a horse. I, I, I mean, I think that's important, but I don't think it's, uh, indispensable to becoming an artist. And so minimal art really affected me in a way, and I, and I realized that um, minimal art um, you know, had this kind of weird um, asociality, I would say, yeah. this kind of non, or this negation of re referentiality, mm -hmm. of reference to the social environment, that was, I, that was troubling. And it was so insistent about that negation that uh, it became kind of a, in a paradoxical way, it became, it was like uh, all the sociality was, was extremely suppressed, right? And I, and I guess I, early on, I kind of had a sense that that was also a kind of emblem of, of particularly the American male, white male psyche, you know, like the Western movie, uh, you know, like Gary Cooper in, as a silent sheriff in High Noon and, and so on. And, um, so I, I, that tapped into me, and, and, and it was recursive in the sense that it tapped into my own sense of being as someone who's not, not white, right? And so on. So I, I started making these, these works. It came, the, first, the, the first time I conceived of the idea, I received a flyer at, at my home, a, a furniture sale flyer. And, uh, you know, they would have these sectional units, and... And usually uh, it's you know it's of a U or maybe of an L mm. because you don't want it to be fully closed off, right? You want it to be you want people to sit in the furniture, and so um, I, I don't know. I just want if I extended that logic, mm. then you have a kind of an impossible uh, totality, mm. right? And so uh, that just uh, so I've been pursuing that, and um, but um, and it's true uh, when I first started making uh, these furniture works, it was met with um, indifference or hostility, right? People, and, uh, but you know, this is, if there's any art students here, I would say, if you really believe in a, an idea and you think it's important, right? Then um, you have to keep at the problem. And so I just kept, kept at it. And now, and now it's like, people are going, could you do a furniture work for us and so on. It's totally different now. I was um, thrilled when you picked the pink velvet for us. I think that's a particularly beautiful iteration of that work. Um, the title focuses on death and furniture, but I think the first series that we decided we were going to include in the exhibition um, was Time and Again, which you had made relatively recently mm -hmm. and you were showing in Belgium last year. Um, and uh, it's a series that uses a format you're well known for, the portrait juxtaposed with text. Um, 
And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the importance of that, that uh, photo and text format um, over the course of your career, but also sort of talk about how you, you um, used it last year to talk about the exper a particular experience during the pandemic. Yeah, sure. Um, the, <laughs> well, you know, I, my formation as an artist uh, was the, the, you know, ember days of conceptual art, right? And uh, there, was a, there was a lot of orthodoxies at that time in terms of uh, art, right? One was that if you were a critical artist, then you had to incorporate text. If you're a critical artist, then you had to uh, challenge the, uh, the system of representation defined by picture making, pictorialism and that you couldn't really, uh, in earnestness, believe in concepts of beauty and so on. You couldn't believe in these things in a, in a way because you needed, we needed to deconstruct that, right? Because it was, we needed to deconstruct the patriarchy, we needed to deconstruct the kind of, um, the c c canon of uh, modern art, all right? And um, so that was my formation. And, there was, and one of the orthodoxies was, was that text would be uh, a challenge to, to the belief in pictures, right? And so on. And of course, we now know with, with uh, you know, in today's age, that text is as uh, disassembling as, as pictures, right? Because text is, uh, you know, you can have fake news, you can have all kinds of things, it's all text, right? You can have a Chiron moving along CNN and it's, and it's not necessarily true. It's still a function of uh, interpretation and, and, and selection of t words and so on. So that was the context for making these things and, and I was, I, I liked the idea of like adjoining it without, one thing I didn't subscribe to was that somehow text would be like this kind of, uh, so, you know, salvational tool, right? Because I also thought text itself w had its pictorialism, so to speak, just as Pictures had its own textuality, right? And they, it's not as absolute in terms of their uh, exclusion of one component to the other. And so I was interested when, when you put image and text together that the presence of one actually destabilized the other at the same time as it somehow anchored it in a kind of modulary way, not necessarily in a, not necessarily in a permanently fixed way and that the picture itself would destabilize the textual part, right? And the way, my attitude is that, you know, even though I, I come up with a particular set of words for the picture and the picture for the particular words, there could be any number of other texts that align with the picture. There could be an, any number of texts that align with the text. I don't, you know? And so that, um, that kind of flux, I, I would say, in terms of, in terms of signification, creates a kind of um, oscillation, right? A kind of mental oscillation, right? And so, and the, you know, the perfect viewing distance for work like, like this is, is right where the, the line in the middle, right? And because there you have equal weight in terms of the, in terms of the com, uh, two components. And um, I like this idea that somehow that, I was also inf uh, influenced by this book by, uh, it was a, um, by Anne Hollander, and it was all about uh, 16th and 17th century Dutch painting and, and, and basically still life and, um, and the question of duration, right? And how did, Fre uh, how did Dutch artists painting uh, these genres of still life, um, um, you know, create a sense of duration, of time passing as you're what, right? Because you're beheld by the work, but also the, you know, system of semi semiotics in, 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 in the picture beholds you, or, or you use a philosophical term, uh, um, you know, uh, interpolates you within the realm of the system of representation of the, of the picture, and you lose sense of time, right? And so you have duration, right? Or as the French say, dire. And so I was interested in, in, in this sense of losing sense of, of, of uh, you know, time passing, right? And the way it, you do that is, these texts become at some point quite mantric, right? They, they're just variations of the same words over a number of lines. 
And in so doing, you, you, it oscillates between the two. You start circling back and forth, go, go clockwise or counterclockwise, or zigzag back and forth. And in so doing, it, it also evokes a sense of the uh, a kind of moment of crisis in the depicted subject having to do with, uh, you know, a basic truth of, of uh, organic life or human organic life, which is that we, we, we are tragic figures because we are all uh, to the, we are, we are to the extent of the language that allows us to be, right? We cannot, we cannot exceed that language in terms of the way we communicate and so on, even though we, as as organic beings are far in excess of that, right? And that's what, you know, that's what, you know, the con, sorry if I get professorial, I guess, so, 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 <laughs> would, would call the, you know, the, the real, right? The, the PTI, as he says, and, and we're always greater than the language that allows us. So in these moments of crisis, we can't, we can't find the words to communicate who we are, right? And, uh, and that's like, uh, not just the limits of language, but it inscribes the limits of, of how we are understood, even if our own feelings are far in excess of, of that. One more thing about these works is uh, there's, an, um, there's a kind of triangulation going on in terms of is this, is this a monologue on the part of the subject? I mean, who, the, the question of uh, the ascription of the speaker is not entirely clear, right? And, and moreover, it's complicated by the presence of the the viewer, because the viewer is the person who actually reads the words, right? And so there's, a, there's an odd triangulation in terms of the processes of identification between the, the, you know, the, the kind of text that's offered and, and, and the person that's depicted with the viewer uh, beholding the work. Yeah, that, um, I mean, it feels like that was particularly so looking at the new work that was about working during the pandemic. I mean, so many of us came to those works and read those lines, yeah. having experienced some variation of what, what you're exploring in, in those works. Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it was an exercise in pandemic time. It was done during the height of the pandemic, right? And even when I, um, uh, you know, I was able to go to Antwerp, do some things and do some works and then come back and then I couldn't even go to the opening because they, they, Belgium had tightened up uh, entry into the country. And so we had an opening on, on Zoom, which is the worst experience <laughs> ever. Uh, so yeah. But I think uh, it behooves artists during uh, pandemic time to not stop working and to make the most of it. You know, I, I wrote two screenplays for movies and um, histor historical screenplays. And, and uh, I continue to do what I can in the context of what the pandemic constraints uh, permits me to do. Yeah, I think the Time and Again series is really interesting and we very, I think people read it in kind of ways that it's, yeah, maybe that distance you were describing in a way because so many people have gone through these emotions and maybe still do them. So it kind of, I think it hits you in a way that maybe some of your work historically, which has been kind of maybe not so much of about a specific time that we all kind of share. Uh, I, and we had a big conversation here at the museum about putting them on billboards, because one of your, uh, as an artist, you've always worked in a number of spheres, and public sphere has been a big, big part of your practice. So we did, well, I insisted on kind of trying to put those works also out in the public sphere using billboards. But it was kind of a moment and a bit of panic here, like, if we put this out in the public sphere, like, do, is this going to like actually make people feel bad or like start questioning their like, the, you know, these some of these statements are very much, I think, quite triggering for people at the moment. And we did did go through a, a period of like trying to get confirmation that we weren't going to kind of hurt anybody or, or, or just, you know, t t traumatize somebody by also you know, putting it out in the public sphere. Because if you go into a museum, of course, you've kind of made, uh, and you, you're entering into kind of a contract, you're saying, I'm going somewhere to experience something quite specific in a contained way. But if you see something on a billboard, there might be kind of, you're, you're less maybe mentally prepared for, for some of these things. But yeah, I mean, it's hard yeah, to I, know. I like, I like yeah. uh, Mizuguchi films because they make me feel bad. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, I, I think uh, I don't understand uh, that question because I, you know, I feel bad when I walk around the street and I see all these billboards trying to sell you crap. Right, that That's makes true. me feel much worse. I know. <laughs> well, so for five weeks, we, or for the yeah, for two months of the show, we have replaced some of those uh, ads trying to uh, sell you something. With, right. with but I don't think I don't think people. Yeah. I don't know that yeah. people feel bad looking at. No. Right? But they feel. You it know, never occurred to me. It was just yeah, kind of it, it runs someone, counter to the yeah. to the to the procedures yeah. of maybe billboards. Yeah. And so you know, but I think billboards should be unanchored. You know, and yeah. this. Destabilized. Uh, I, I just want to mention Michelle has already mentioned the mirror maze, which is uh, one of my. It was actually a, very much a highlight for Documenta Eleven for me. But in general, like just the kind of a, and after seeing that, seeing your work for the Istanbul Biennial uh, too, it's it's left a kind of a lingering impression in my mind as well. So maybe. Do you want to talk a bit? There's a lot of mirrors in this show. There's the photo mirrors, there's the mirror maze, and there's the necrology series, which is also kind of some sort of, in a way, a textual mirror in mm -hmm. a sense. Do you, there is a, you know, the, the mirror is a recurring theme in your practice. Too. Well, well, first of all, mirrors are a very important uh, th theme or, uh, yeah. of, um, of art history, right? Uh, going uh, way back, right? I mean, any painting of a Medusa is always about the threat of the, of the mirror to her. Uh, you know, Caravaggio's um, Narcissus, which is not a mirror, but you know, the boy's looking at his own reflection off a, a pool of water, or uh, any of the so-called um, Venus paintings of Titian and um, Caracci, and you know, um, is of a, usually of a of a. A, a nude in her, in her vanity and with a mirror, right? And it's, and it's slightly coquettish because the reflection is actually, like the Velasquez one, the, the, the Venus is actually looking at the viewer, the reflection in the mirror, right? So, um, it, so one, it's, a, it's, it's import, salient to our history. But two, the mirror is also kind of a very interesting um, polysemic device. It's like, it, it's very, it's very, on the one hand, it's fixing. On the other hand, it's, it opens up to many um, interpretations, right? And um, because on the one hand, when you stand in front of it, it's, it's very unifying, right? Because you see yourself and, and, um, and, there's, and because of the relationship of verisimilitude, uh, it uh, has this kind of proximity to the ideas of verity and truth. So you see yourself in front of it and, and that's you. That's it's very truthful, right? But you know, going back to Lacan, it's also uh, uh, evidence of the split because you can actually see. That's not actually you, right? That's only a reflection of you in time and space, right? That's another you that's in front of yourself, right? So, and then on the other hand, the mirror uh, often is, uh, you know, the, the broken mirror, the shattered mirror, right? The fragmented mirror it also talks about the kind of fragmentation of the self. Right, and so on. So, it's a very kind of paradoxical uh, device. And of course, it was the symbol par excellence of um, of La Lumière, right? The 18th century, late 18th century, uh, you know, so-called the Enlightenment, right? The philo philosophy of the Enlightenment, you know, the sovereign self, the individuated self, rational self, uh, who could make complete and correct decisions. And even if you made an incorrect decision, you had the ration rationalism to amend and redress an incorrect decision, right? Of course, it was highly racialized, right, for Euro European white men and so on, right? So the mirror, I was always interested in this because I think it represents an emblem of a kind of ethos of our society, or at least the society that, uh, if you look at the f earlier moments, or the earlier er moments, uh, that's another philosophical term, the er, right, the, er, the foundational moments, then, you know, that generated this present moment, then, you know, enlightenment philosophy, the way we think about the individual as a kind of sovereign being, right, he, over and above the kind of formations of community, is, is still very extant, still very uh, uh, important. We still like to believe in that. And of course, that completely aligns with the logic of uh, capitalism as well, that we need individual consumers en masse, right, doing the same thing, but, but at least thinking 
psychologically they're doing it out of free will and free choice. So for me, the mirror was always that. But, but I'm not so much interested in the mirror um, as this um, reflective surface where you stand in, in front of it and you, and you apprise yourself of your own uh, sense of what you look like. I'm actually more interested in um, the idea that, uh, of someone else looking at you as you're looking in a mirror or you looking in a mirror and seeing someone else looking in another mirror. And, then, and so I like this idea of endless refraction, refraction mm -hmm. and that, um, and that uh, you, you, you espy the other almost by an elliptical glance, often unanticipated. Mm -hmm. And so I like that relationship. I like this relationship of, of um, coming into contact with another um, surreptitiously, yeah. right? And, that, and that's always uh, been in my work for whatever reasons. Like when I, I can be on a, a bus, so I'm always interested in studying people, right? Their physiology and so on. I always know someone and uh, I'll see someone and maybe someone has a stooped shoulder and I'll think, yeah, well, that person probably works really hard at, at some awful job, right? So I'm always, I'm always interested in that type of question, you know, and often I'll talk to them on the bus, <laughs> which uh, I don't do as much in the United States. It's more creepy <laughs> when you do that in the United <laughs> States, but I used to do it more in Vancouver. <laughs> um, when we were, uh, pulling together the list of works for this exhibition, you, you sort of very um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Gently offered up ideas about what was available, but given that you do curatorial work yourself, um, you didn't really shape the exhibition at all. And speaking of Zoom and the difficulties of the pandemic, um, you're seeing the exhibition a week before it closes mm -hmm. for the first time. I understand that we even forgot to send you the um, installation photographs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if... And the contract. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you have... With, with payment. <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to do okay, that. No. Um, she was supposed to send the images, so we're all playing. <laughs> I'm wondering uh, just what you what you think about what what you've seen over the last couple of days, the juxtapositions that we came up with, the flow of the exhibition. We've talked about individual works, but um, I mean, I think the exhibition has a certain impact as a whole, and I wonder if if you feel the same well, way. Well, at the risk at the risk of uh, flattering both of you, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think I think it was a very sensitive eye. I think you uh, maybe it was because of our camaraderie over Zoom, right? Um, which is possible, by the way. Um, you, um, I think you you had a, a real sense in terms of uh, my work, and so I think it's and I think it's beautifully installed. I don't think it's easy to install. Uh, and distribute the works in the way you have, given the scale of the rooms. I mean, the rooms are massive, right? And but it doesn't look massive. It looks like it's breathing properly. So I thought I thought it's, it's great. There's a fantastic installation team here too. Yes. Um, um, do you want to? Was that the point of the question for me to flatter you? No, no, that wasn't the point at all. In fact, I thought you were going to to you once suggested no, but that also, I not Michelle, ask I don't, the question. I, when I cur when I curate, I don't curate uh, my own work. Yeah. Right. I usually yeah. the shows I've done are more uh, historically thematic or yeah. right. A lot of artists do curate their own work, right, and I, don't. I, I don't was even, actually I don't even write about myself. I was actually giving you a chance to point out that we um, were very oddly anal in the way we installed the mirror maze, putting all of the um, symptoms in numerical order, which you don't usually do. Right. No, no but I think, uh, what can I say, anal is good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a different kind of situation than depression, but it's its own thing for sure. I mean, yeah. I. I've already spoken for 40 minutes or so. I, there is so much. I, I, yeah, it's so much. There are so many questions I want to ask you. But really, in a way, my, the biggest 
question for me was always kind of like, I, I've been coming going to Canada for 15 years. Uh, I was familiar with your work long before I ever set foot in Canada. It's, it's interesting in a way that um, you've had such an incredible career. You're one of the most successful Canadian artists, but, but you're oddly overlooked, I would say, in Canada. And it was kind of surprising to me to find out that in the past 11 years, you only really have had three shows, including this one in Canada. Uh, you told me yesterday that you've you briefly, very briefly, had a dealer in Canada, but that's it. You've never, in some way, even though you're uh, quite an important figure, both as a teacher, as an artist, and curator in Canada, there, is, there seems to be uh, kind of a, an odd uh, misrecognition of you. You haven't really kind of uh, been as celebrated as some of your peers, uh, especially from Vancouver. And I, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't want to make you kind of sound bitter or anything, but do you, what do you think that's about? Is it, is it just kind of chance or is it, is it something that your work is in some way a little bit more difficult, a little bit more political, a little bit more out of the art market kind of than some of your peers that have been more celebrated, I would say, not more successful? Well, first of all, if you want me to sound bitter, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I think I think uh, I think my work is hard to categorize, right? So it's like you can't really say, well, uh, he does these paintings. I have, you know, I, I work in kind of it's very multivalent, many channels of work, and they kind of intertwine, right? And so, and, and when I first started in art, which was in the late 70s, that was very verboten. It was not something which you were supposed to do. You were supposed to be, you know, m you know media, medium specific. You had to choose a thread and just follow it. But I was already working in different ways. And for the first many years, I would say, people were going, he's all over the place. Why? <laughs> And, and so on. But now people see that there's a logic to it. And moreover, mm. among young artists, they're all doing different mm. forms, right? I think it's I think that's as it should be, because I think the worth of an artist's work isn't these kind of artificial um, you know, definers of what you know what you're allowed to or, or the ways you're allowed to work, right? Which is one thread or two or two threads. Right? But the but the oeuvre, right? The total totality of your work, that's that's what it's more important, right? But I also think um, my work, uh, and sometimes I actually took years off. For example, when I curated uh, the Shanghai Modern Exhibition, which is, you know, important to me. It was it was a show about um, the First Republic of China and uh, after the May Fourth uh, Poetry Movement, 1919. Um, you know, so it was a show about 1919 to basically, uh, you know, before the you know the Communist Revolution, 49. Um, I knew I, I was producing a kind of knowledge that hadn't been dealt with, right? And so I took two and a half years off, right? I wasn't really making work because I couldn't, because I was going through various little archives and, and so on in China. And uh, I remember at that time, I lost my New York gallery because the New York gallery says, it's time for you to show. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, uh, no, but what I'm doing is too important. To, uh, and and, and uh, they go, well, you're going to risk, you know, uh, our relationship, basically, right? And so, and I realize the art world's not very accommodating that way because there's a kind of calculus in terms of schedules and, and so on, even though I have no regrets. I feel like I did that. But lastly, I would say that, um, you know, if I can, I hope this isn't sounding modest, but there's all kinds of artists out there in, in the history of art that are really interesting artists precisely because they didn't fit in, right? Like in Paris, if you go to the Gustave Moreau Museum, yeah. kind of fantastic painter, you know, right? Kind of slightly, slightly mystic, you know? And um, he's known, but he's not really widely known, or like Odilon Redon or Leon Frederick, you know, all kinds of really interesting artists that don't quite fit in, right? And I remember, um, um, Early on in my career, meeting with uh, the late Dan Graham, who was quite a well-known uh, New York uh, American conceptualist, and we went to the Gray Gallery, 
uh, on a tour, and uh, it, was, it was about Bay Area art from San Francisco area. And so we saw jazz, we saw lots of um, artists from that area, era, and uh, Dan said to me something which I never forgot for whatever reasons. He said, oh, right, here's so-and-so. He's such a good artist. I wonder what happened to him, right? So I went home and did some research on, this is before the internet, remember? So I did some research on this guy, and it was like, he was doing work, but for whatever reasons, it, was, it couldn't quite fit into you know, the kind of canonizing re reduction that was, was taking place in terms of you know, the kind of post-minimal art, right? Because his work was slightly outside of that. I mean, Smithson, Robert Smithson is another guy. That, he, of course, he's well known, but, but for a long time, it was hard to reconcile his work. Eva Hesse, even though she's very well known, it's hard to reconcile, right? And so I think, um, and uh, you, you look at fluxism or uh, and form art, uh, Group Zero in uh, Munchen Gladbach, there's lots of moments of art that's really, really interesting, but we have a very narrow and reduced uh, idea of what's legitimate art history, right? So maybe I'm a bit of a victim of that, but I, I don't really care. I have to, you know, that's, a, that's up for the market. <laughs> I don't really care, you know. Time check. Any last We've only gotten questions? like, uh, we've gone through like a third of our questions, by the way, <laughs> so. Uh, we can keep going, we can keep but going. we suspect but, that, yes. that, uh, I'd like to get the audience to ask Ken questions. Has yeah. prompted some questions amongst you, yeah. so maybe we should move on to that. Um, we have two mics on either side uh, in the aisles that you can go up to. And we also have uh, Kelly, I think, who has a mobile mic, um, if you would prefer not to stand up. And it looks like we have a question over We've got an audience in the aisle. Here. Um, I just want to um, uh, follow up on uh, the thread that uh, Ewan brought up about uh, the sort of broader recognition. And uh, some of those slides, the one on, um, are just sort of worth thinking that the, that the recognition of your work has been sort of as unusual in a way um, as the work is. And um, one of the things that uh, I sort of wanted you to talk about a bit more was you have this Van East, uh, it was uh, sort of like a free-floating signifier. Um, I think it sort of comes out of graffiti in um, East Van that you made a, a large uh, sculpture out of that. Um, and then this image that you had of uh, Melly Shum hates her job. And, um, and that piece is really unusual because um, I remember being in Rotterdam and people, people would talk about that, uh, that, that piece so much so that the institution itself got renamed. And um, that's, sorry, that's a very unusual uh, thing to have happen where an artist creates a work and then the institution gets, you know, named after that work. Um, so I was wondering, could you just um, explain kind of how that happened? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just kind of wondering, like, does that, uh, like, sort of how does that affect you? Like, do you become kind of the first spectator of your own production when something like that happens? Or is that even possible uh, when you're making art? Well, I should say this is uh, the great Jerry Allen, the painter, who's, uh, who's, uh, who's an MFA student of mine uh, 20 years ago at UBC. So uh, reconnected in 20 years. I've been delighted to see him again. Uh, well, first of all, the success of the uh, Melly Shum work in uh, this work in Rotterdam um, was something unanticipated by me, and uh, thus. Um, it was embraced by the city, right? And uh, I don't actually feel like I have any title to it because it turns into something else. It's actually owned by the people, right? 
Um, for those who don't know, um, I had the inaugural show in the then name with the Witt Center for Contemporary Art, which is a brand new Kunsthalle in, or Contem Institute of Contemporary Art in Rotterdam. And um, they had this old billboard uh, on the side, and they retained it to ostensibly announce the prevailing exhibition inside this building. And so when it came time to, for my show, which was the first show, um, they said, here's the layout for your show for the poster outside, right? And it was like, you know, Ken Lam, dates, da 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 da, and so on, right? And I said, no, how, for whatever reason, I have no idea. Um, I said, no, how about just an image of Meli Shem hates her job outside, right? And they, and they scrummed, they thought about it, and they came back, they, oh, okay, right? And the understanding was always that this would come down at the finale of my show. And, but then when the sh show came down, and because someone else's show was going up, they started to take this down. They took it down, and the uh, Wit de Wit, which was named after a street, Wit de Wit Strat, was uh, f inundated with calls and letters from people demanding that the post billboard be put back up. Right? And so I get a phone call. I, I was in Vancouver then. I get a phone call from the museum, and they said, oh, we've got a very unusual situation. It's okay for us to put it back up, mm -hmm. right? And I said, oh, that's unusual. Why, why is it, uh, what's going on? And they said, that, well, we've received a demand from the public to put it back up, right? And I said, why, right? And uh, the, the curator, chief curator, who I was speaking to said, well, the best answer I can give you is that one lady said, every city needs a monument to people who hate their jobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And this is a true story, right? So it's not, not anything I anticipated. And it's been up since. And now, if, you know, as you know, if you go to Rotterdam, it's, it's one of the things to see in Rotterdam. Yeah, Ken is a legend in, in Rotterdam. It's I, I, many times, and it's true. So what happened was Witte de Wittstadt is named after a Dutch colonial Navy officer and in the kind of Dutch attempt to decolonize a bit, they decided Witte de Wit to, to rename, and it was, they had a two-year period of f trying to figure out names, and it was pretty innocuous, boring names like Rotterdam Art Center and stuff like that, and then eventually got rebranded or renamed Kunstinstitut Meli right. after Meli Scham. Right, but one of the delicious ironies of that as well is Vit de Vit as a surname stands for, in English means white, whiter than white. Yeah. Which <laughs> is totally, totally yeah. can't make this stuff up. So. Yeah. so, I mean, that just kind of happened like that. And so I've been, and, and with this one, it's also been embraced almost immediately by, by the city of Vancouver and people. Um, it, it was just a confluence of happy circumstance, mm. you know, and and as soon as it went up, people who saw it said, how long has this been up here? I said, it's been up a week. <laughs> and they said, are you sure it hasn't been up like years? Yeah. Like people just kind of had this weird, they were disoriented. They just thought this work was always there. Or, but I think what, it, what that told me was that I always felt the work was always meant to be here, even before it existed. Mm -hmm. And so I've been lucky that way with the number of um, public artworks I've, I've done. Hello? Um, so I can't, my I can't hear you. Hi. Better? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so I'm just uh, interesting that the question of memory has come up just now, and I'd like to hear more of your reflections on your work at the Monument Lab and just general things about, you know, collective memory, past, present, future, and your reflections thoughts, what's oh, happening in the Monument Lab? That's a broad, short sure question. I mean, Monument Lab is a uh, Philadelphia-based think tank. I, I, it was started in my office at the University of Pennsylvania with a colleague who teaches in the Department of Urban Studies. And um, we had uh, discussed, uh, you know, um, the monumental inventory of Philadelphia, for example. There's over a thousand statues and in Philadelphia, it's you know, a city founded in 1648. And um, of that 1,000, there's only, there was, at that point, there was not a single full figure uh, statue uh, outside of slave statuary 
of a, of a renowned African-American Philadelphian, right? At the, up until that point, there was no full figure, historical figure, uh, statue of a, of a Philadelphian woman. There was one of jo Joan of Arc, right? There was one of Joan of Arc, and there was one of uh, Mary Dyer, who is, um, who is a, a kind of a Quaker, but from, from Boston. And so I w Paul and I were both interested in this question of, um, well, what does the you know, network of public art message um, to people, right? Because all public art kind of creates a kind of space and dialogue. And so, and, and, and not only does it create a kind of message of, that's consensually wrought, supposed to be consensually wrought, and that cannot be uh, challenged in terms of its singularity of narrative, but uh, it actually displaces alternative narratives. Because you know, history is not just written by the w w winners, but history is also, history also speaks truth to power in the sense that the powerful excludes the voices of the less empowered, right? And so that question prompted um, a kind of think tank in terms of well, how can we um, produce um, a, syst a, a methodological system to um, speak about alternative histories? And how can we um, you know, uh, democratize public art on these, these types of questions? So that's how we came up with the uh, Monument Lab. Now, what was uh, interesting was that you know, the kind of social reckoning that was maybe only percolating when we started in 2012, really kind of broke out in the opening, open, as you, as you know, a few years later, right? And um, people kept uh, coming up to me and saying, well, how did you know? How were you so prescient in, of this moment, right, of be out Black Lives Matter and so on? And I actually, I mean, joke, Paul and I joke about that because we, we, we thought we were late. We didn't. We, we didn't feel we were prescient. I think where we were maybe a little bit in advance was formalizing it in, in, in the kind of institutional frame of Monument Lab, right? And, uh, and so now it's like, uh, it's almost, <laughs> it's, it's so successful, it's like I don't have time, time for it, right? But we have like almost two dozen people associated with Monument Lab, we have like a multi-million dollar budget. We try to keep it very, uh, focused on what, how we started, right? The same culture, same questions. We don't try to, we don't take on certain projects. Like for example, the Fort Lauderdale wanted us to uh, advise them in terms of how do we, how they could deal with um, you know, their um, minority communities because uh, they've had such a broken record in terms of their police department, right? So we, we don't, uh, we're not a PR firm, we're not trying to, give uh, you know, guidance for uh, redress for heinous crimes that the Rome Police Department started. So, you know, we, and so that's how it came about basically, right? And so we have, um, and now we're likely to curate a major show in, in Munich on, on the various suppressed histories of Munich and so on. So I think the strength of Monument Lab is, um, is that even though we are a think tank, we, we, we prioritize the thinking of artists. We try to think like artists, right? We don't try to think in terms of, so like when we did uh, the first major iteration of, uh, you know, it was a $3 million budget show called Monument Lab, Creative Speculations for Philadelphia, which resulted in like full page reviews in New York Times and five minutes in PBS NewsHour and, you know, Newsweek, Time, you name it, Washington Post, and so on. We didn't, um, you know, we, we, we kept to, uh, you know, the, qu the question, we, we kept to the keeping everything open. We weren't about providing answers, right? We were, uh, and we also, um, we also made sure that um, voices, that all voices could be heard. We didn't try to skew questions and, um, and we also didn't underestimate, and this happens everywhere, um, the wisdom that's, that's offered by 
people at a micro-geographical level. For example, one neighbor to neighbor. So if someone said, oh, uh, the, uh, the Collins, they've been living in that house down the street for four generations, right? We go, that's interesting. We'll write that down, right? We don't go, that's, that's unscientific knowledge. That's not official knowledge. That cannot be science, rendered in science, right? We will we count that as important, right? And and um, and that's a, that's actually a lesson from Michel Foucault about uh, the importance of what he calls subjugated knowledges. Subjugated knowledges are the knowledges that lie outside official knowledge, right? Probably the most subjugated knowledge and the, the prescience of the subjugated knowledge is has has never been more abundant and clear during this time of pandemic and uh, anthropogenic time of, the, of global warming and so on, is First Nations knowledge, right? Which was largely oral, wasn't written. It was always seen as unofficial and unscientific and therefore not to be heeded, right? And yet we now see how, how smart it was. It is, that knowledge. And we, we ignored it at our peril. So we try to keep, you know, and, and memory isn't just what's recorded. Memory is what people pass down uh, from one generation to, to the other, right? And, uh, and so we saw our project as a uh, uh, pr project of democracy, but also a project of con perennial speaking truth to power. Um, so we've talked about a couple of um, public artworks that you're really well known for that have resonated very deeply with the communities that they've been placed in. Um, but I also know that there have been uh, like a couple of proposals of yours for artworks that you know haven't been accepted. Uh, and um, I wonder how you navigate those situations as an artist, particularly in relation to Monument Lab, where you're trying to create this, as you say, sort of democratic public discourse around official memory and subjugated memory. Um, yeah, can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, I mean, um, I, yeah, I have a career as, a, as an artist, but I don't think it contravenes what I'm doing as in, in Monument Lab. Um, um, I mean, I, I could cite uh, one work, for example, in, in Toronto, which I actually won. This is a true story. It was a monument to uh, Chinese laborers who built the railway, right? And it was sponsored by the Chinatown uh, Chamber of Commerce in, in Toronto with the city of Ch Toronto. And um, it was given to someone else, and it's a, it's a, the winning proposal, uh, winning, I put in quotations, uh, was a, is a, of a trestle, and it's very heroic. You see these kind of realistic bronzes of Chinese workers, very muscular, and they're kind of pulling on a pulley and working building the railway, literally. And, um, and then um, there was some controversy at the time because um, they, uh, I, I was one of the only Chinese artists uh, who, uh, uh, who didn't get, uh, you know, I made the shortlist, I think, but I didn't uh, win. But, I, but, you know, that's the way it goes. But what happened was um, more than 20 years later, I went to a, 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 a social party in Toronto and these two people came up to us, came up to me and they said, um, oh, you don't know us, but we know you. I said, yes. And they said, yeah, um, we were jurors for the Chinese railway workers, public art piece in Toronto. I said, yeah, I know. I didn't win it. And he goes, they went, no, actually you did. <laughs> right? And I said, how could that be? Right? They said, yeah, we, we, you, you won it, but the uh, person from the Ch Chinatown Chamber of Commerce was really against your proposal, right? And so all our votes turned uh, and we gave it to the second proposal, right? And I said, well, why, why would they do that? And he said that because uh, the, that the Chinese guy uh, said it, mine was too, um, uh, Depressing. It was. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't um, exalting enough. It wasn't. You know, and so on. I'm going. I'm going. Yeah, but it's. We're, we're talking about 
you know, indentured laborer. It's not exactly a happy story, <laughs> right? And so on. So those things are beyond my control. I was shocked by that, and I was also afterwards when I went back to my hotel, I was a little bit annoyed that they, it took them 20 years to tell me that, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and because it would have helped me out as a young, young, much younger artist at that point, you know? So, um, again, I don't know how to answer that question because it's, I, don't, um, I don't see the two as contravening one to the other, right? So I, I think uh, I bring um, a kind of X factor to Monument Lab precisely because uh, I'm an artist, right? It's not. Otherwise, it would be, if it was academic, which I can also, you know, inhabit that world, um, I think it would have been a mistake, right? It's the Monument Lab's kind of unpredictability, like what, even the question of what is it exactly makes it, um, gives it its strength. I appreciated your earlier idea about how it's necessary to evaluate language's limits in communicating what there is outside of us and, and interpreting the world beyond. Uh, when I got into visual art, I kind of had the notion that I wanted a visual language that would be universal. That uh, I've lived in French for 10, 15 years, and Eng born English. But in visual art, I was seeking a visual language that would go beyond the necessity of using a spoken language alphabets. Now, where we are now, when I started into art at the end of the 80s, uh, it was still very much all analog all the time. And the international language of communication in the art world was English. It was the facilitator, the modem language and it permitted an exchange between people of different native languages. It was the, the diplomatic bridge in a certain measure, and largely because of economic colonialism that spread it. And coming into the digital age, it stayed with that aspect of being a, a universal diplomatic language, because largely because Silicon Valley, which invented the digital world we're in now, was English-based, so English got a pass, and it carried through into this digital age we're in. With all the opportunities to divest ourselves of the colonial mindset, there's a bit of a rush to disengage that dominance of the English language. And in a generation, we may well see the end of English. And so much of the art today that, that has English being used as the go-between, bridging language, the universal, because it's shareable, it's become de facto the shareable language of a planet that's created this planetary uh, community. With the decline of that role of English, what do you see as the next chapter in, in visual art? Well, first of all, I don't entirely agree with your uh, reading because I, if you go to uh, see enough exhibitions, you'll see, especially because I, I'm a bit privileged because I live near New York and I'm in New York twice a month. Uh, there's all kinds of international artists and uh, you have text and, and, uh, in, in their native language. It's, right? So a lot of Chinese artists, it's, you, know, uh, you know, Wang Yongping, uh, Chen Zhen, and all, all kinds of, Xu Min, a lot of them, they use Chinese all the time, right? Of course, on the title, it's, uh, it's translated, right? Because it's in New York. So I think uh, there is, it's not as, it's not like somehow there's a tyranny of, of, um, of English uh, of, uh, over and above everything else. Of course, it's become a kind of, you know, this sounds f funny to say, a lingua franca, because, you know, it's the kind of mediating language, right? And of course, it was born out of, um, you know, I think also the structure of English being very accommodating compared to French, for example, and also, which I also, I also speak, uh, but that um, 
uh, uh, but I don't think it's, um, and, and it's useful, right, to have a kind of lingua franca. You go to China and all the kids now speak English, right? And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, I think that's, that's a good thing. I think it's a, just a bad thing when we, don't, we only speak English, we don't speak anything else, right? So, I mean, I speak three languages, right? But, but usually people just speak English here in, in Canada. I think that's, that's more, uh, more bad. But I, but I do think, um, you know, in terms of universalism, there is a kind of story to, to art, right? Art started in relationship to the hamlet, the village, and in relationship to rituals, daily rituals, seasonal rituals, the harvest, and, and waking up at when, when the sun goes up and going to sleep. And, and of course, not just ritual, but ritual uh, aligned to religion and the sense of spirituality, right? This kind of relationship to, to nature, but nature in the kind of transcendent sense of organized by God and these sorts of questions. So, so there was always, at the, at the foundational moment of art, it was always um, consensual. There, you know, right? If you put up a work in the public square, or even of a village, there was, there was very little differentiation in terms of contesting the meaning of something as being unfair, right? People just, it was consensual. That has, and that was universal, that was the truth. That's the way, that's the order of the universe. That has extended all the way down through much of our history, right? Until, you could make an argument, until the Renaissance and this shift to the, you know, the human-centered Right? And, and, the, and then even after that, the kind of fragmentation and, 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 and doubt of, of a singular um, purpose to art, right? And why is that? Because time and space became increasingly fragmented by uh, the division of labor, the division of, um, of, uh, of race to otherness, the privileging of some over others, um, the the, 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 the kind of differentiation that takes place because of different climates, ge different geographies as people start intermingling, right? Sometimes for coercive reasons, such as through slavery and so on. So, but yet at the same time, we always held to art as somehow this kind of um, historically consensually wrought system, right? Which is very romantic, right? And so, and that continues to this, this, this day, this kind of nostalgia for the kind of universal in, in art. I think there are moments of universality, like if there's a huge disaster in the world or something, you can t talk about through s aesthetic re systems of representation something. There is a, you know, but I think it's also not possible for something to be truly universally consensual. I think that, that's only because the world has become so differentiated on, on, on every level of the social. And so that's the big question that's taking place right now with, um, with uh, you know, taking down of monuments, um, particularly in the United States, is this con conflict between, um, between something which is seen as like, uh, even, even if it wasn't consensual and people acknowledge, like, uh, it, it, uh, like a, a Columbus statue, I would say, Right? Uh, people like it because it's just been there a long time, right? They feel th that uh, they feel uh, that that would shake up or destabilize a kind of w world that was that they feel even if even if they were not sympathetic to that world, they feel at least it's stable, right? And so that's that's scary for a lot of people. I understand that, right? But I'm an artist, so I, you know, I, I, I not that I welcome destabilization, but I welcome you know, but I'm interested in, in, in how these things turn um, uh, and how these things affect, you know, the formations of the social, of the, of the subject, and so on, um, as differentiation continues to propagate. So um, that's the best way I can answer your question. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, 
I just wanted to ask a question about uh, joy and community. And um, I'm not maybe 100% sure, but I think I was visiting in Amsterdam in maybe 2015, and I saw a wor billboard works of people and their dogs in a park. And it really reminded me of the work that you do here in the Remy Modern. And I'm wondering if I'm connecting you t at the right place. Did you ever do a community work about people and dogs? People and dogs? Yes, it was in a park and there were billboards and it just reminded me so much of the, the way I experienced your work in the, in the Remy. And I wondered also about these images here and if they were also taken in Belgium. Well, these, these pictures were taken in Antwerp, so mm -hmm. it is done, done in Belgium. Um, but I, I, that must have been another great artist. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that they were looking at you because it was, uh, it was interesting how, how they broke also the, the billboard in half with, with text and Yeah, I, I, actually in London there's a show of uh, uh, an artist who is doing image text and uh, and it's it's a bit odd because um, it's uh, they frame it as uh, you know I forget the series it's framed and then it goes after Ken Lum, right? And I'm going why why, why can't you do your own work? <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. And also it, it was weird because they, they didn't look carefully in terms of how I take my pictures. My pictures are always full figure. Sometimes like a foot would be off the frame or right. And I always use a certain type of font. Right, and so, yeah, it's, it's happened to me a number of times. It's always as if somehow that I'm supposed to go. Oh, okay, that's fine. You can you can do that, right? But it doesn't look e anything like my work. So why do you need? need it? I would them. I would prefer them to not say after me, and just <laughs> they did this work, you know. But it, but it is very interesting because I when I even saw these people. I felt like uh, the return to my travels and that I could see these people working in their restaurants and their shops or playing in the park and I felt like they all seemed very familiar to me. Oh, okay. And similarly, I Well, I, I do think uh, identification is uh, important, right? Yeah. So I try to make my work um, about something real that people can identify with, yeah. right? And, and because I, ultimately I think it's about what I can produce in terms of uh, Fic uh, feelings uh, on the part of the viewer. Yeah. Right? That, I th that's, I think, is most important. Yeah, I thought you went into a shoebox in my closet and pulled out all these little family portraits and put them on the mirrors also. I thought, hmm. he must have been to my home and <laughs> gone through my photo album. So. Actually, with the photo mirrors, the, the pictures all came from disparate sources. And, uh, but um, what's interesting, of course, is that um, so long as you, they, they form a set within a singular mirror, uh, everyone assumes that they came from one source, right? But they all came from different sources, right? Just want to thank Ken and the audience for your participation. And yes, I want to say it's a great, great being here because, um, you know, and this is not a platitude. Believe me, I, I, um, I said it to my friend Marie Lanou last night too, which is that. Um, you know, um, people say, oh, you're, when was the last time you went back to Canada? And I, I said, well, I went to Tr Toronto once. I went to Montreal once during the trip. And he goes, and how was that? And I, I went, yeah, I, was, I like both cities, and I'm excited to go there, and, and so on. But, but then um, I knew this trip was coming up, and, and, and then I, I, but I didn't have time to pause. And then finally what I did, I went, yeah, Saskatoon. <laughs> I was really looking forward to it. And, um, more, much more than going to Toronto, Montreal, because I live in a really, I, like Philadelphia, the metro area is six and a half million people, right? So it's, and it's only six and a half million because it, it butts up to the New York metro area, right, of 18 million. And so, so you go to Toronto, of course, it's also six million, and Montreal, I think it's three, three and a half. They're big cities, right? So it was like, yeah, I mean, not the same, but it was nice. But coming here was like, literally, uh, you know, like, wow, like the, as f far removed from, it's almost like the anti-Philly, right? Which, which I really appreciate, right? So, and uh, I haven't been back here in a long time and it's really uh, much more diverse than I remember the first time, which was like 40 years ago, but the first time. And uh, yeah, it's a gem of a city, you know?
the Paris or the prairies, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kenny. I kind of looked out the window, looked at the idea wall, and said, oh, there's no cars. It's so nice. And I'm sure <laughs> that's not how most people in Saskatoon think of that highway, but yeah, <laughs> yeah compared to Philly. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.